We are um, on week two of a series looking at the theology or the, the kind of teaching of Jesus around the idea of the kingdom of God. And last week we saw that um, the kingdom of God is the most spoken thing that Jesus comes bringing um, over and above things like marriage or heaven and hell or sin, all that stuff. The thing that Jesus talks about most in the Gospels is this theme of the kingdom of God. And last week we mapped out what the kingdom of God is versus other kingdoms. And we explored the fact that actually it's not a question whether you serve a kingdom or not, we all do. Whether that's commercialism or the kingdom of desire or the need for success or the kingdom that idolizes relationship status or the perfection of our children or our homes or Instagram profiles, etc. fill in the blanks. We all serve a kingdom and those kingdoms have rulers And they have rules and metrics of success. And the the question is, are you going to choose the kingdom that Jesus offers? Jesus came for a, a sole purpose, and that was to preach and demonstrate through his life and his death and resurrection the message of the kingdom of God, also known as the gospel or good news. But what is the good news. You might hear it as Christian jargon, or we might um, hear about the gospel, but what is it, and why is it so essential to the kingdom of God? The thing is, every kingdom has its message. Every kingdom has its propaganda. Every king- kingdom has its strap lines that it wants people to understand and ascribe to. And what would happen in the time of Jesus is whenever there was a new king or a new ruler in town, because there was no Instagram or BBC News in that part of the world, um, or in any part of the world, um, what would happen is there, there would be a, a representative sent from that empire, from that kingdom, to arrive in your town or your village or your hamlet, um, whatever it is, and they would announce the, uh, the news that there is a new king in town and what that meant for you in your household or in your family or in your business. So it might have meant that there might be a drop or a rise in taxes. It might mean that now there is a a new God you have to worship because you are part of this empire. And these people that would go out from this place, from these places, were called evangelions. Evangelions, which is where we get the term evangelist from. Someone who declares the new news about a new kingdom that is happening. And what we have in, in the Bible is we have someone going before Jesus called John the Baptist, who goes and says, prepare yourselves because there is a new king in town. There is a new kingdom, and with that kingdom comes a new set of rules or a new way of understanding. There is a change in leadership, and there are consequences because of that. But why is the gospel good news? We're going to read from Luke chapter 8. I'm just going to get some water because I'm feeling a bit parched this morning. I dug a grave yesterday. I didn't dig a grave yesterday. I, I, I dug a massive hole in our back garden to bury a bath, which looked like digging a huge grave. Um, and I'm exhausted. Luke chapter 8 says this. It'll come up on the screen. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out, Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path it trampled on, and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop, a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables so that... Though seeing, they may not see. Though hearing, they may not understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the words from their hearts, so they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. 
The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a good crop. So why is the good news good news? Well, the first thing to say is the good news is good because the hearers of it involve all kinds of people. And I love the people that Jesus assembles around himself, particularly those who are in need of God's grace and his mercy and his love. We're told right at the beginning of that chapter, the 12 are with him. They're the the 12 people, disciples that have been hanging around Jesus. And also some women from whom had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, we know about her. um, And then we're told that whom seven demons had come out. That's pretty full on, isn't it? Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. So you've got people who have a history of being demon-possessed. People who have a history of being, having evil spirits and diseases. People have a history of working for the opposition, for the empire, Herod's household. Why is this important? Well, the book of Luke was written about 85 CE, so about 52 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. And yet still... The people who Luke, as he's going around interviewing about what was going on, still the people who were around Jesus were known not as heroes or saints or spiritual gurus. They were known by their weaknesses. They were known by the, oh yeah, I'm the one who had several demons cast out. Oh, I'm the one who who survived through evil spirits and diseases. I'm I'm the one who used to serve the empire um, that was trying to quash this new thing. Because when you meet Jesus... You can't not tell of how much you're in need of his saving. That it's not about me as a superhero. It's about God's grace working through me and amazing things happening. When we encounter his love, it's impossible not to tell people of our flaws and our brokenness. Because it highlights God's grace in your life. We're told in 2 Corinthians, Paul is writing and he says this. Jesus said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected. In weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest on me. Who's aware they have a few things not quite right with themselves? Who has a few weaknesses? A few of us? Who doesn't? Wicked, we're amongst friends. It it should be a testimony to God's goodness and kindness when we're super honest about the rubbish stuff in our lives. Now I don't, see, I don't know if I've ever seen a Twitter profile or an Instagram handle or anything like that that's like, yeah, I was the one who was once demon-possessed until God saved me. Or I'm the one who was known as, as um, someone who slept around, Mary Magdalene. I, I was known as someone who, who, who used my body for financial gain. Yeah, that's me. Or, oh yeah, I'm the one who has actually been through a load of evil spirits and diseases. I'm that one. Do you want to hang out with me? Do you want to hear more about Jesus' love? But God attracts people to him amidst weakness. It's not when everything is going perfectly that his grace shines brightest, but when we are holding on for dear life, we're holding on to our faith, bare knuckle, despite our circumstance, that people suddenly go, oh, that's, that's quite powerful, isn't it? It's quite powerful that even in that circumstance, you can still hold on to faith. Even amidst that suffering, you can still say God is good. That's pretty powerful. Because it's easy for millionaires to be like, yeah, God's great. <laughs> I've got it sorted. It's easy for people who are at the top of their game to be like, yeah, God, God's got it. But when your life is falling apart and you're still like, yeah, God, I'm clinging on, that's when your friends will start to take notice. That's when your friends will go, you know what? That, that God might be worth following. That God might be different to what I was thinking about. And there's a wonderful, beautiful story in the life of Jesus where he is, he, he's on his own. He approaches this well. And in the middle of the well, he encounters a woman from Samaria. Now, Jesus was Jewish, spoiler alert, and um, he encountered Samaria. And at the time of Jesus, Samari- Samaritans and Jewish people did not hang out. There was kind of all kinds of racial tension. Jews believed that um, they had the full kind of uh, um, revelation of God. And Samaritans said, well, actually, we don't need to go to Jerusalem. We can worship God wherever we want. Um, and, and that really upset Jews. And so they, there was all kinds of tension that went on. Jesus encounters this woman at the heat of the day. And in Israel, that's the time you don't go for water because it's really hot. And if you're going to lift water, you don't want to do it. You, you should go right in the early morning when the sun's still down. And so this woman's on her own for a reason. 
This woman's on her own because she was known as someone who had multiple husbands who had been uh, married, divorced, married, divorced, married, divorced. And Jesus encounters her and he says, uh, he says, can you give me some water? And she says, but you're a rabbi, you're, you're a Jew. We shouldn't even be chatting, let alone you asking me to serve you. And he says, if only you knew who is in your presence. If only you knew that the living water is in your presence. And then they have this really interesting discussion about her marriage. And he says, I know that even the person you're currently living with is not your husband. And for whatever reason, in that midst of brokenness and weakness, it's at that moment that she begins to realize that the person who's with her is the Messiah, the chosen one, the one she can hang her hopes onto. And she leaves. She leaves not downtrodden, like, woe is me, but she leaves shouting for joy. And the story goes on, verse 39 from chapter 4, says this. Many of the Samaritans from that town, the town that she was from, believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. Who would love that? Who would love Jesus to tell you everything you ever, like everything you ever did? Who would be so gassed at that moment that you're going to go back to your work and be like, Jesus told me everything I did, everything I watched, everything I clicked on, every, every lie I've said, told me everything I did. Hallelujah. Isn't that amazing? But the Samaritans saw it. So when the Samaritans then come to Jesus, they urged him to stay with them. Like, tell us, tell me the stuff I've done. Tell me the mess I'm in. And so Jesus stayed two days. He hung out. He made a weekend of it. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Amazing story. Amazing story. This wasn't someone who had gone to study a theology degree and came back with all the right answers. This is someone who was made aware of her brokenness by Jesus and that spiraled in her a story of grace. Jesus doesn't wait for us to be polite or biblically literate or know all the right answers to begin telling people about the good news, to be evangelions in the empires we stand in, to be evangelists. If you've experienced his love, you've got a story to tell. You have something worth sharing and your story is always far better than a million sermons, even my ones. Your story is far stronger than a million Alpha courses even. In fact, the reason people come to Alpha is not because of the content. It's partly to do with the good food. But the main reason people come and they stay is because they hear stories of normal, everyday, non-professional Christians who have met with Jesus and it's radically changed their life. And it's far more compelling than a lecture or a book or a course of any kind. John Wesley who was uh, one of the founders of the Methodist revival, when asked, how, how can we be evangelists when we're not confident in what we say or we don't know the right answers or we haven't studied like you have? He says this, this is how you can do it. Do all the good you can by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. That doesn't take a theology degree or, or knowing all six, six books of the Bible inside out. Doing good goes a long way. On Thursday, uh, the Penny Lane staff team, we went on retreat, and retreats are meant to be like peaceful and quiet and chilled, um, and we, pu we pulled up, we were staying in this barn in the middle of nowhere, um, and we were told by the person who owns the barn, park up and then walk down the country lane, don't drive down it, it's, it's not very good. But I was like, we've got stuff to carry, um, I don't want to carry that stuff, it's meant to be on retreat, it's meant to be chilled. But anyway, the person who was driving the car was very wise and said, no, we'll park up and follow the rules. So we parked up, but as we did, another car that wasn't part of our convoy overtook us and just started driving down the lane. And I was like, they've gone down the lane, why can't we go down the lane? And the person who's driving is very law-abiding and says, no, we're going to get out of the car and we're going to walk our stuff up. So begrudgingly, we emptied the car, started walking up this lane. As we walked up this lane, a lady approached us with a, a German shepherd and said, I'm really sorry, but I've got a really random request. Do you know where I can turn around because my car is stuck on a boulder? Um, because it's gone down this lane and I've driven into this boulder and I can't move my car, can't move it back, can't move it forward, can't move anything. I was like, guys, this is an opportunity. Captive audience, she's not going anywhere. So I was like, we'll sort it. There was four of us and I was like, we'll sort it, we'll lift your car, love, don't worry, don't worry. Just get the dog back in the car and we'll lift it. I tried to lift it and failed miserably. In fact, I got my whole front covered in sheep poo while trying. Um, but anyway, I, I said to the lady, in fact, don't worry, because another car is coming with another four, four people. We'll be able to lift your car. Do not worry. I, I will say it was like a, 
a Nissan Micra or something. It wasn't like a Land Rover, which is why she got stuck on a rock. Um, anyway, 20 minutes later, I, I took the stuff back to the house and then came back and made sure she was okay because she was a bit distressed. She, had, um, she didn't know where she was. Uh, There's no signal, so she couldn't GPS it. And I was like, don't worry, another four people are arriving. They're all very strong in the Lord. Not probably <laughs> in my, but um, it'll be fine. We started chatting about church. I said that, you know, we've, uh, we're from a church and this is our staff retreat. Anyway, another car came and um, we all gathered around her car and we lifted it, lifted the whole car off this rock, pushed it back. Penny Lane staff team, represent. We're, if, if you're ever stuck in a ditch. Um, but what was amazing is uh, the next day, she, uh, she started following us on Instagram. She, she lives in Yorkshire. Started following us on Instagram, and then um, she posted this. Uh, she had no experience of church. I chatted to her a bit about church. Like, do you go to church? Like, no, not at all. And then she said this on her Instagram. And there's a little picture that went with it. Can we have that picture? Look at that. <laughs> As us lifted the car. There she is in the back left. Um, but she posted this on Instagram. So it doesn't look as bad in the photo as it was in real life, but me and Jax, who's her dog, went on an adventure. Went the wrong way down a tractor lane, drove over a boulder and got completely stuck. Panicked and had no signal. If it wasn't for Penny Lane Church appearing on their own adventure, I'd have been stranded for hours. I can't be more grateful and thankful for such kind, caring, and friendly people keeping me calm and being completely positive when I was about to go into complete meltdown. They lifted my whole front car up. The whole car, guys. <laughs> well, there, so I could get back on track and reverse down to the road. If there was the biggest thank you in life I could give, it's these amazing people. They could have kept walking, but they all pulled together and helped me out. I'll forever be grateful for them saving the day and going above and beyond to help me. Fun, isn't it? Fun, is it? I mean, yeah, yeah, cool. It's all right. It's all right. Been to the gym recently, haven't I? <laughs> but the thing is, is kindness is so underrated, I think. Kindness is so underrated. And the word kindness literally means to treat someone as if they're your kin. To treat someone as if your brother, sister, mother, father, treat someone as if they are your kin. And actually, if we think about how we ended up in church... Each one of you, why are you stuck in church, probably has some testimony to do with some kind of kindness. I started going to church when I was 16. But when I was 11 at primary school, I had three mates, Ben, Tom, and Joel. And they had an uncle who was in a Christian worship band. I didn't know what one of those was when I was growing up. Didn't have a clue. But they said, that, oh, uh, my, my uncle's band is doing a, a show at the seafront. Come down for it. So we went down to the seafront, and I kind of stood right at the back as far as possible, listened to some kind of like U2-ish kind of music. And then, uh, but then he took me backstage. They said, I want, I want to introduce you to my, and I was like, cool, I'm now meeting the guy that was on stage. This is quite a big deal. And then they gave me this signed CD. Um, and for whatever reason, when I ran away from home when I was age 14, um, I, I left from the, the South Coast to live in London. One of the CDs I took with me was that signed CD, partly for sentimental value. But also I realized there's a couple of songs in there that I just used to put on every now and then when I was feeling sad. Did You Feel the Mountains Tremble was one of them. It was a banger. There's a song called Happy Song that really inspired me. Um, but also, while I lived on this council estate in Sussex, um, every week there was a guy who worked for a church called Paul. And Paul would get in a minibus and fill it with loads of lovely people from his church. And they would come to our council estate and they'd play football with us. They would uh, put us in a minibus and take us laser tag and bowling. And basically, they would, they would go after the, like, uh, the kids that basically with their face said, do not come near me. Um, those guys, they would just go straight for. And I just experienced in those moments a love that was just different to all the other kind of male romulas I had on that council estate. Mrs. Hillard was a teacher in my primary school who was the choir teacher. She had choir club and stuff like that. Um, I was the only guy in choir. And the reason I did choir was because I was, uh, got in a bit of trouble and I was about to be suspended, and they said, unless you do an extracurricular activity. So, so I picked the one with the most girls in. Um, and uh, so I, I sung the solo for My Heart Will Go On at one point. Uh, it was wonderful. But Mrs. Hillard was a lovely, lovely Christian presence, so kind. When I moved to secondary school, there was another se uh, secondary school teacher, Mrs. Pern, who was a science teacher, and I hated science. But at one point, I got in a slight altercation at, at school. Can you see a, a running theme? Um, and at lunchtime, she, she said, now, with violent behavior, we, we usually exclude it, like straight out, no questions asked. But she said, if you promise to meet with me once a week at lunchtime and chat about what's really going on at home, we can see what else we can do around my behavior. 
And I didn't realize until like three years later when I became a Christian, she was like front row crew at, my, uh, at Laura's church um, as we were growing up. She was a Christian displaying an act of grace in the work environment. James Dorner is a mate of mine who now works for Mercedes in the pit stops. He used to get my bus every morning to school, the same school bus, and every Monday he would ask me, how has my weekend been? Not because he cared, but so that when I, in a polite English way, said, how was yours? He would then tell me everything about his church service. He's like, my pastor, you should hear him preach. It's amazing, incredible, incredible. You should come to church. It's lovely. We've got all sorts, croissants, all that stuff. It's going to be great. There was another guy, Dave Bourne, on the same school bus who was a Christian, who when I had some funny questions that I'd learned from listening to Ricky Gervais or someone, I would ask him questions and just patiently, he would just answer them or say, you know what, I don't know, but I'm going to ask my pastor. And all this stuff just like patiently loved me. And I share all those because you just have no idea what a display of kindness in your working environment could end up leading to. The loads of those people would have no idea that a couple of years later I become a Christian, then I start leading young people, and, and, and now we're leading a church up here in Penny Lane. You just have no idea what uh, a display of kindness can lead towards. Romans 2 verse 4 says, God's kindness is intended to lead people to repentance. It's not God's anger or wrath or your cleverness at discussion or you learning all the right answers, but display of kindness leads people to life change. So the good news is good. The good news is good because the hearers involve all kind of people. The good news is also good because it's God doing the sowing. Our job is simply in the um, parable of, um, of the sower, our job is just to grow and bear fruit. It's God who does the sowing of the seed. And the thing is, is throughout a lot of church history, it was believed that Christians took God to unknown places, to far off countries and other nations. They would almost put Jesus in their backpack and take him to other places. And then they would unpack their backpack and teach people how to sing certain songs and teach people how to read English and go, wow, now you're Christians. However, that is not the way that God works. And there are stories time and time again of people being drawn to Jesus without any human agency, any institution involved, or even any Christian presence. From Muslims having vivid dreams about Jesus to Chinese prisoners of war finding themselves compelled to sing the name of Jesus when under duress. So in the mid-20th century, a few theologians started using this phrase, this Latin phrase, missio dei, which literally means to the mission of God, to differentiate the missio ecclesia, or the mission of the church. And the basic idea is this. Instead of thinking that we are taking God with us wherever we go, and which is quite scary, you're like, it's all on you, like in your workplace, you might be the only Christian that someone knows, so it's all on you, whether or not your mates come to know Jesus. Instead of thinking that you're taking God with you into your workplace or into your school or into your home, God is already at work. The Bible says this all the time. Since the beginning of Genesis, God is at work bringing people back to himself. He's already on a mission. And our job as missionaries is simply to get involved in the work of God. To, to know that God is already at work in Liverpool, to listen to him and see where are you at work, I'm going to join in. Matthew 16 uh, says, uh, has this amazing story where Jesus has brought um, his disciples to a place called Caesarea Philippi. And Caesarea Philippi was basically like, um, uh, it was full of temples and statues to Greek gods. It was like where you would go if you were a Greek and you wanted to go for a festival, you would worship at Caesarea Philippi, surrounded by statues. And even to this day, if you visit, there's kind of ruins everywhere of old Greek temples of all kinds of gods. Jesus takes them there to ask them this question. Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Jesus then eyeballs them. He says, but what about you? Who do you? It doesn't matter what other people say about me, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter, who's always the one to answer first in all of the Bible, he says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The gates of Hades will not overcome it. 
I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Jesus is the one building his church. It's Jesus who says, on this rock, I will build my church. And that gives me so much courage because I'm going to mess up. We're all going to get things wrong. But this church is not dependent on earthly wisdom or us making sure our strategies are in check. We plan and we strategize and we prepare because we want to be good stewards of what God has given us and blessed us with, but we're totally dependent on God rocking up and showing up. And I've shared quite often that when we first arrived and we first started opening, reopening these doors, I would hide in the toilets because I was terrified that no one would come this Sunday. And I still worry every now and then on a Saturday night, I'm like, I turn to Laura, I'm like, are people going to come tomorrow? Are you sure people are going to come? Um, but it's on God to grow his church. And it's why that we pray every single Sunday without doubt, come Holy Spirit. Because we need to factor into our church life a moment in the service where God can take us off piste. We need to have a moment where God might do something that we haven't planned for. We need to have a moment where suddenly God might do something in the life of you and, and, and I where suddenly God changes the script. It's so important. It's the Lord who adds to the church. And church growth theory and practice, though helpful, only tell us where to kind of prune and what fertilizer to use, but in no way do they cause or even explain the miracle of people coming to know Jesus. So the good news is good because it's God who's doing the sowing. And thirdly and finally, the good news is good because it's really, really, really good. It is really good. And this is a risk, but um, if you have felt God do something significant in your life or in your family's life or in how you view God's love for you, since you've been coming to this church, would you just pop a hand in the air? Okay, cool. Wicked. Yeah, you can. You don't have to be shy. You can be. So if you felt God move in your life since coming to this church in some meaningful way, stick a hand in the air. Cool. Wicked. You can turn around and look at the hands in the air. It's cool, God's doing some stuff. John Wimber, who's a bit of a hero of mine, said this, that we want to take the ammunition of balanced evangelical theologies, that's all the stuff in the Bible, we want to take the ammunition of that with the firepower of mainstream Pentecostal practice, loading and readying the best of both of these worlds to hit the biblical target of making and nurturing disciples. That's a cool quote, isn't it? It's a cool quote. We want to take the things of the Bible with the things of the Spirit to nurture and make disciples. The thing is, as Jesus enters the scene in first century Galilee, what he doesn't do is come up with the 10 point plan of how his church is gonna grow. He doesn't even come up with like the next seven things you gotta do to get closer to God. He rocks up into a synagogue, he pulls out a scroll and he says this, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's what it's about. That's what the good news of the kingdom is about. It's good because it's really, really good. And anything else that gets kind of muddied in the way is probably not of the kingdom, it's just our stuff. But the thing is, is we've seen people be affected by that kingdom since coming here. Not only have we been able to baptize some people who had no experience of Jesus at all before coming here, we've also hearing kids regularly in our kids groups, hearing from God regularly. And it's amazing to hear. It's amazing to hear stories of parents who who said, oh, their kid over dinner said that, oh, I heard God say to me that he really loves me. Like that sets them up. Far better than a fuzzy felt little diagram of Noah and the ark. Hearing the voice of God is going to set them up for life. We've had adults in this building experience the Holy Spirit tangibly for the very first time in their lives, even if they've been going to church all of that life. We're hearing local community loving having a church around that is alive and that has life in it. And we've been asked by the local community to do all kinds of things. Even some members of the music scene of Liverpool know that there is a church for them. That there is a church that is actively praying for the creatives in the city, that is trying to create space for the musical uh, culture of this city to thrive. This week at our play cafe, we had 64 people show up, 
And we're seeing a regular oasis for parents who, at that point in time when you've got toddlers, it's so exhausting. And being able to create a space for them to have a bit of an oasis. They also hear a Bible story and sing nice songs and, and learn and, and experience community together. We're seeing our refugee and asylum seeker community getting loved and accepted even when they're moved on. And there, Ben was telling me a story just this week that so often uh, people are in, in the system just get moved on randomly. And so we'll build a relationship with them that will be amazing and we'll kind of uh, get them almost up on their feet and then suddenly they're in Bolton or somewhere else. Um, and, and yet Ben has been like partnering them up with churches as they've been going into those places. So they're finding relationship almost immediately in a church local to them. This stuff works. The good news of the gospel works. And it's why we're here. So you have something to share. We aren't inviting our mates just into a dusty building with no life in it, but to a community that will love them. A God that has done everything to be in relationship with them. And who knows, who knows what may happen to your best mate who doesn't know Jesus when they encounter the love of God. The person that you chat to in the workplace. The person you chat to in a random lane where their car has been stuck on a boulder. At the supermarket with your flatmates. And it begins with just simply telling your story. Hey, I've got a lot of mess in my life. But this is how Jesus works. I've got a load of stuff going on in my life. But this is the grace of God in, in motion in my life. Because we want to do all we can to be a church that's creative in how it reaches people for the kingdom of God, how we hope for the things of God's kingdom and invite people to belong in God's kingdom and play their part. And we do it all for the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're going to pray that very scary prayer. Come Holy Spirit. Let's stand. It would have been very easy to just um, do a 17 ways to share the gospel. Um, but we've probably all been to some of those classes. Simply share your story. And it comes from a revelation of God's grace. And so we want to ask for that now by his Holy Spirit. So if you want to close your eyes, if you feel comfortable to do so. And maybe put out your hands as a sign to God that says, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to be moved by you. I'm ready to experience you. Jesus, we pray, would you come by your spirit?